Okay, I've, I've pleasure in um, inter introducing uh, this evening's speaker, Alan Kroll, uh, for his presentation on the installation of floating offshore wind turbines in the, in the Celtic Sea. He's a fellow of uh, IMRST and, and Wiener, and it continues research in the subject at the University of Exeter uh, after 51 years experience in the design, construction and offshore installation of marine structures. Um, I suggest that we keep um, microphones muted and use the Q&A facility for, uh, in Zoom to write, to write the questions for sorting, for sorting at the end. Uh, is everybody happy with that, the uh, Q&A facility? Oh, I've got, got a QA facility on mine. <laughs> yes, Chat on it'll be. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yes. Just. Well, thank you for letting me speak to you this, this evening about. As Jeff says, I've been working full-time for 50, 51 years. First of all, I worked for Vickers Shipyard in Barrow and Furness on the construction of nuclear power submarines, HMS Invincible and other ships. And I did some subsea work as well with them. And then in 1978, I joined John Brown Offshore Engineering in London. And I've been with that company in its various forms and it's now owned by McDermott Incorporated. I still work a few hours a week for McDermott on LNG ports, uh, offshore jackets, and offshore installation work in general. A year ago, I decided to go back to university to study for a research degree, and it's into the installation of floating I mean, for the next three quarters of an hour. Floating wind turbines. This is a, a, a wind farm off Portugal. Three semi submersible floating wind turbines, a cable lay vessel alongside uh, floating wind turbines, and you'll see different acronyms used flow, FWT, FOW. But if I use any at all tonight, it'll be FOWT, FOWT, Floating Offshore Wind Turbines. I want to talk about the Celtic Sea, installation sequence, installation vessels, mooring types, turbine sizes, costs, and some conclusions. And then I look forward to any questions that you might have at the end. Um, Alan, Alan, Alan. The, the, yes. The voice is breaking up a bit on the on the screen. I don't know if, if it could be changed. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's, it's, is that it's, clear? It's breaking up quite a lot, actually. Is it? Yeah. Uh, I've got them. I've got them on maximum. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, if nothing else, I'll show you the pictures and that, that will show me most of the things that are going on. Right. So floating wind turbines, they're possible in 60 meters of water, but it's most likely that there will be only economical above 80 meters water. A hundred types of floating wind turbine. The tension leg platform, of which none is. The tension leg platforms will be very difficult to install because they have very low stability during the tow out. Semi submersibles are developed from offshore oil and gas, and the spars likewise. The spars have very Deep draft, 70 or 80 meters draft. And we'll talk about more about that a bit in a moment. Um, Alan, it's, Alan, the, it's, it's just it's just been yeah. suggest, 
it's just been suggested that you might turn the video off and, and that might improve the. Uh, it might improve the I'll turn my video off. Or then if it. Or, 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 or turn mine off too. That's it. Is that better? Yeah, that, that's, that's probably better. Yeah. Yes, yeah, okay. okay. In the in of of Scotland, there are five steel spars. They have a draft of seventy meters. It's unlikely that they would be used in the Celtic Sea simply because you need eighty or ninety meters of sheltered water in which to construct them. The one, these were all uh, finished off in Norway in the fields. And there's nowhere in the south southwest in the Celtic Sea where we could actually build these things. So, but they will be fe feature further in the Northern North Sea in the future. Despite all the conferences and papers and talks there are about floating wind and promises by politicians of different colors and different hues, there are actually only 16 working floating wind turbines around the world. There are three semi-submersibles as you saw in the picture at the beginning in Portugal, five semi-submersibles off Scotland, five spars off Scotland, a concrete barge off France, a steel barge off Japan, and a steel semi-submersible off China. In addition to that, there are 11 concrete spars under construction. You can see that the, the UK has the most, 10 of them, but none of them were built in Britain. They were built, the substructures were built in Spain and in the case of the semi-submersibles outfitted in Nether the Netherlands and the spar outfitted in Norway. Currently, the UK has no capabilities for building floating wind turbines but the government has recently offered a lot of money to Wales and to Scotland for the building of floating wind turbines in the future. The most common type now and probably in the near future are semi-submersibles. They're three-legged, they have four anchor lines, two on the turbine corner and one each on the other corners. You see lots and lots of artist impressions of floating wind turbines, semi-submersibles in particular, and they show the turbine in the middle. But the, pro but the problem with putting them in the middle is that they reduce the crane capacity so much that they're not really viable when they're in the middle. So you'll see all the working ones have the, fl have the turbine in one corner. They have drafts of around about 10 to 12 meters, these steel semi-submersibles which again is relevant when we come to look at ports that might be able to build these structures. This is the largest semi-submersible. It's, it's been built in China. It's a one-off and it's enormous. 91 meters long, 91 meters wide, 32 meters high. It's only got a five megawatt wind turbine on it but it's been built for extreme typhoon conditions. And there are three mooring lines per corner. And again, the turbine, as you'll see in this moment, is over one of the corner columns. In this case, it was built on land, loaded out by trailers onto a submersible barge. The submersible barge taken out into a little bit deeper water and a semi-submersible floated off. And then after that, the, the turbine was fitted on the top. Here's it during tow out and you can see it needs one very big tug and several small tugs to, to steer it. And you can see very clearly that the turbine is over one of the corner cons. Here you can see the moorings being fitted. And in order to do that, they, they moored two crane vessels in the general location and then brought the semi-submersible floating wind turbine in between them and then connected the moorings. This made it easier to, to reduce the motion, the, the surge and sway motions 
of the floating wind turbine during the hookup of the mornings. In this particular case, the electricity goes to one of the fixed platforms you can see in the background. The Chinese have just built one of these. And here you can see the K dynamic array. There's been discussion about WaveHub. WaveHub is a There's a connection point off Hale in Cornwall, and there's the possibility that one of these semi submerged. You can see that it's a massive structure, it's 390 meters long, 120 meters in height, from kind of Mornington, with a turret. A swivel turret, similar to what we see on Calm Boy FPS operating in the wave hub to produce electricity to produce to go into the uh, terminal there and to bring it to shore. The Celtic Sea. There are some interesting things about the Celtic Sea, and this is first of all we think about where is the Celtic Sea. It includes that area in grey, and it includes the Irish Republic, the United Kingdom, and a little bit of France. In its, the Celtic Sea at the north northeasterly end is governed by the line between Rosslare in Ireland and Fishguard in Wales. The Crown Estate own in UK waters own the seabed, floating on ones. Three off the southeast, off the coast of Pembrokeshire. One off the coast of Wales, and you can see the lines. I don't know why the Crown State line between uh, the UK and Ireland is so jagged, and the line between France and uh, the UK is straight line, but. Uh, that's the line, lines that they show in their publications. Most likely ones in the near future floating wind turbine farms are going to be. In addition to that, Ireland is thinking about the emerald field off the coast of Cobe, so off the southeast coast of uh, of Ireland, off the Kinsale Head, close to where there's some existing oil platforms. Some of the complexity of, of trying to develop a floating offshore wind turbines includes all the power, all the uh, telephone wire cables that are laid on the seabed, uh, Butte in Cornwall some of the uh, south coast and Lamoran, and then others around Bristol. There were, there are also a couple of power turbines. We've got to make sure the anchors are clear of any of these existing power, uh, uh, telephone cables. And in addition, laying the export cable to the shore, making good crossing points. The water depths, as we've already said, it's expected that floating wind turbines will become, see most of the Celtic Sea is around about 50 to 100 metres. Early development of of floating wind turbines. The German or British bombers in the last war. There's also a lot of munitions that 
taken from on land areas where there are UFOs. And UFOs where we intend putting a wind farm or the export cable, then they will have to be removed. It's not such a good uh, picture, this one, but it's showing the kind of seabed that there is in uh, the Celtic Sea. Out in the middle, it's soft mud and the dark blue. But closer to shore, and particularly the Cornwall, you see the harder orange soft soil. We'll probably use drag anchors. Where you've got medium soil with a bit of sand in it, we'll use suction piles, first of all, if possible. If we're in hard rock for our, for our moorings, where we're looking at dr drilling piles into the seabed. This shows the various is that currently we're looking at area eight and seven and four. Wind speed is in sixteen of around about 11 to 12 meters per second. And I, there are other considerations as well. This is a picture of RAF Portreath. It's not a flying station, but it's one of the most important RAF stations in the UK. It's one of three places where we've got major uh, radar stations. And one of the problems with wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, is that they interfere with radar. And the Ministry of Defence is currently carrying out studies to see how they can mitigate these problems. A fixed structure offshore is fairly easy for them to deal with. They can put uh, clutter filters onto their radars, but the problem comes if something is moving. So with a, a fixed wind turbine, you've got the moving blades, and with a floating wind turbine, you've got the substructure moving as well. And this particular problem hasn't been solved as far as I'm aware as to how we can integrate radars in areas where there are floating wind turbines. There are also wildlife considerations as well. The, uh, in, during the installation phase, this may interfere with fish, particularly if we disturb the seabed, it will interfere with lobsters and crabs, rocky seabed areas. Turbines have an effect on birds, migrating birds. And there's also a running effect on the behaviour of fish in the local area. This shows the one of the sites in Scotland, and it shows the area that's closed off, the safety zones. So there's a wide area shown in green there, which is the export cable route. And then around the wind, floating wind turbines, there's another area shown in red, which is also an exclusion area. There should be no uh, anchoring by any type of ship in those areas. There should be no trawling in any of those areas either. And you can, if you think about the, the moorings on these floating wind turbines, if they're in 100 metres of water, then they're probably out a 1,000 metres in radius in terms of the mooring line. So it's, if we have a big wind farm with floating wind turbines, it will shut off quite a large area for trawling in the future. As you can see, this is a map showing the different water depths around the UK and Ireland. The dark blue is suit very suitable for monopiles, hence why, why they've been developed first. That's up to about 30 or 40 metres. The light blue, we need fixed jacket structures. 
and the green areas we can use floating wind turbines. I want to speak to you now for a few minutes about the installation sequence. Having got some of our consent place and started to look at the wildlife in the area where we were to put the wind, a met ocean boy to measure waves, wind, and currents. We'll also measure variation in tidal height, and we'll come back to that in a moment. The next thing to do, having put the met ocean boy in and kept it there for probably a year is we use the side scans of the route and the area where we're going to deploy a technical survey to look at the boreholes and see test. And so the design work on the left hand side goes into the export cable and following the design of the export cable we need to do a grapnel run obviously not picking up any tele telecommunications cables but trying to make sure that there's no debris no wrecks in the area where we want to lay the export cable and then the export cable is laid buried and protected In parallel with that, we designed the moorings, which let's assume for a moment they're at drag anchors and chain. We then go offshore and install those moorings. We then need to design the substructure and on the right hand side, the, the top sides, which includes the tower, the nasal and the blades. Following completion of the substructure and the top sides, they're all brought by ship to a fit out port hopefully within three days sailing time of the offshore location. And then that completed structure is towed offshore, connected to the moorings and con connected to the dynamic array cables. In parallel with the export cable installation, we would also carry out the UXO clearance. The surveys. It's important that before we install any floating wind turbines, that we carry out a met ocean study at that particular site. We want to know the wind speeds and wave heights in particular, the currents, air and water temperatures, the salinity, air pressures, and the tides. So if we have a big tidal range, which we do on the up against the Pembrokeshire coast and in towards the Bristol Channel, then that will make some of these options, particularly the Tension Lake platform, very difficult to install. So where we've got big tidal variations, it will have to be something that's continually more such as a spark or a semi-submissible. And it's important to get at least a year's data on the weather so that we have a good picture of what these weather conditions are like. We need a geotechnical survey to, to look at, to carry out boreholes, to do CPT testing of the seabed in order to understand what the seabed is like down to 30 or 40 meters below the seabed level. Vital, this is vital data for the design of the morning system. We also carry out uh, this seabed for wrecks, for boulders, for looking at the general lie of the seabed and, and developing a very detailed bathymetric chart of the export cable route and the offshore wind farm route. It's quite possible that if we have some big debris on the seabed, that we will need a dive support vessel to come in and try and remove some of that debris. Or this, these kind of vessels will also be equipped with ROVs as well. It's very important that 
the seabed where the export cable is, cl is clear of all the debris, old fishing nets, redundant wiring and ropes, removal of out of service cables and boulders and that sort of thing. And again, this can, this, some of this work can be done with work class ROVs. The UXO clearance is done by very specialized vessels using some of the similar equipment that we've looked at already of side scan sonar, of ROVs, and they will have to decide when they find the UXO, whether to try and move it and destroy it somewhere else or to destroy it at the location. The main ports are clearly Falmouth and Plymouth and Portland. On the Welsh coast, which we'll come to now, so Falmouth, rather, Falmouth has a water depth of about eight and a half metres. If we wanted to fit out semi submersible crane vets, semi submersible floating wind turbines, we'd probably need 10 to 12 metres. So we might need to dredge a little bit there where the red cargo ship is and strengthen the key for large onshore cranes. Milford Haven has a bit more water depth, but there all the all the good all the keys are in fact used for oil and gas import and export. There's a good key, but it doesn't have enough water depth for our floating wind turbines at present. If there was dredging carried out in the foreground there. Interestingly enough, uh, Associated British Ports who own Port Talbot, they have a port facility there that already has sufficient water depth, but of course, they don't do, normally do fabrication work there. They've got 15 meters of water, and that's for bringing in bulk carriers carrying iron ore. But you can see that from the top pictures how these floating wind turbines will be developed. The so substructures are built on short, put onto a submersible barge, floated off. Perhaps the left hand side, you'll see the output key with a large onshore crane there being used to fit out the floating wind turbines. It's how for Port Tubbard. There's some schemes in place for the Cromarty Firth in, in the northeast of Scotland, about some of the vessels that we're going to be using. We'll be looking at some fast transport heavy lift crane vessels which will be used for driving piles, drill piles and suction piles. And we're looking at tugs and other things. So dealing with tugs, as you can imagine, these floating wind turbines, the semi-submersible ones, have a very large wind area. We're looking at one or 200 tons of bollard pool required. And as always with towing, it's always better to have one tug rather than several. So ton plus the pull the winter turbines offshore available. There might some of these some but for the offshore uh, in, uh, moorings, drag anchors, those big anchor handling tugs we've just looked at would be used for that purpose. However, if we're installing suction piles or driven piles or drill piles, we need these big crane vessels. They cost upwards of £100,000 a day to hire. 
three of them, the Aga, the Bokalift, and the Constellation are already in existence. And the Stellar Alpha and the Orion are currently under construction. They've been developed principally for the fixed wind market, but they will come in very useful if we need to install piles for our mooring system for floating wind. As we've said, the, the gravity anchors will probably be used at the wet storage areas. These would be very big in size and not really suitable for offshore work. The suction piles are well used in some North, in North Sea floating, floating situations, but the most common type of mooring system is the drag and bendman anchor. And wherever possible, this will be the first choice. If we have to use drilled piles or grout, uh, drilled piles or, or, or drilled piles, they, they will be expensive to install. You can see here with suction piles, they're very simple, large tube, 10 to 15 meters in diameter, mooring chain pre-attached, uh, a valve at the top, the suction pile is put it lowered down to the seabed. Uh, an ROV attaches a pump to the valve and sucks the, 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 the water out and that sucks the, the suction pile down into the seabed. In certain soil conditions, they're very useful. If we're driving piles, we need, as we already said, a specialized crane vessel with dynamic positioning, dynamic positioning part two or part three, because we don't want to start laying at moorings for this particular vessel as well. And so it would deploy the underwater pile frame onto the seabed and then take the part of the underwater hammer down onto, onto, and operate it through it. It would also require at least one ROV, probably two, to monitor the, under, the subsea work. And then we've got uh, underwater pile drilling. Again, the equipment has only been used a few times in deep water anyway, but again, it's a sophisticated crane vessel that needs to be used in order to deploy such equipment. And I show you these items because of the hard rock situation there is particularly off the coast of North, of North Devon and North Cornwall. We will need to be looking at possibly uh, drilling piles into the seabed. This show gravity piles and you can just see here how big they are. This is an inshore crane, not an offshore crane and it's useful for inshore moorings. You can see the drag anchors. Top left-hand picture, you see the drag anchor, you see the buoy the boy that's going to be go attached to the uh, mooring line as well. Common feature, plenty of anchor handling tugs around in the North Sea area to be used and could be brought around to the Celtic Sea. This shows a semi-submersible crane, uh, semi-submersible floating wind turbine being pulled offshore. Again, a big tow towing it and some smaller tugs alongside it to steer it. As you can see, the turbine is over one corner, not in the middle. There are a few barge type structures being put forward. This shows again with a turbine on one side and it shows harbour tugs manoeuvring this barge structure around the harbour in France. This shows the spar type structure built horizontally in a field in Norway, floated off from a heavy transport vessel being manoeuvred by harbour tugs. So this shows a semi-submersible on a heavy transport vessel being taken from Spain to Rotterdam for fitting out. This shows a cable lay vessel, in this case, on where there are fixed wind turbines. And this is laying the cables between the uh, 
between the turbines. We will be needing uh, one type of one vessel like this for the export cable, which will probably be could be as much as 220 kilovolts, and then the inter the interarray dynamic cables, which are a different type, probably 33 or 66 kVA. And then finally, another cable lay vessel, which will come along and lay concrete mats on top of the export cable to give it protection from trawling. The route clearance. In order to make sure there's no debris where the export cable is going to go, we would need a grapnel train to, pu to pull along the seabed and cl clear things that are there that shouldn't be there. We need, of course, to be very careful where we are close to existing telephone cables. The dynamic array cables, there's usually, there would be one off each floating wind turbine. And again, we need these specialist cable A vessels to install them. We can see here the wind farm in Portugal with the cable A vessel alongside. Here we can see the cable trencher. It's important that the export cable is buried into the seabed. And so it, there's one of two ways. One is digging a trench and laying the cable in it, or the other way is to, is to jet, jet the cable into the seabed if it's very soft mud. And then we would need to look at putting concrete mats over the export cable to give it fur further protection. So despite having rules saying that people ships should not anchor in the way of these export cables, it's inevitable that it happens sometimes. And uh, we need to protect the cables using concrete mats and burying them as well. And then in order to complete the structure, we would need one of these service operation vessels. They work on dynamic position. They carry crew boats. So in order to commission the floating wind turbine, this will be the last phase of the work with, the, with vessels. And people would stay out on one of these ships for weeks at a time, going from one floating wind turbine to another, carrying out the commissioning work. A little bit about turbines. The current size is around about 10 megawatts. And there are some on order up to 15 megawatts. And, we, and these 15 megawatt structures have a tip height of 270 meters, a rotor diameter of 240 meters. And the hub height is 150 meters above the water line. And the hub height is important because that's the height to which a crane, an onshore crane, has to reach to the fit out key in order to fit the hub and the blades. This means that very large cranes, onshore cranes, are used. And again, like some of the vessels we've looked at, there's a very limited number of them. So that shows the, the turbine to 15 megawatts. They're gradually increasing in size, and people are now looking at 20 megawatt machines as well. Costs. A little bit about electricity production in GB. And I say GB because this is Great Britain uh, electricity production, not, not the United Kingdom. Last year, around about 25% of our wind energy was produced from wind which about 12% came from onshore, about 12.8% came from fixed offshore, and an absolutely negligible amount came from floating offshore. There's a way of describing how you compare different types energy production. The cheapest electricity from renewable energy is onshore wind. Then you can see the, the brown line between that's fixed 
offshore fixed wind turbines, of which there are quite a few. And then the blue loss, the expect float present for floating wind. And it will only cut with only with technology advances will these costs reduce from building just a handful at a time through to mass production. And that's not started yet. It's not likely to start for a year or two. We're currently in what's called, we're ju we've just installed, as we've said in the North Sea, some demonstration and they're producing electricity for the national grid. In the future, when we're looking at full commercial wind turbines, we're looking at. Oh, looks like we lost the speaker. That's a shame. Uh, uh. Well, it's a way I was hoping to ask. Um, I, I wouldn't able to see the slides at the beginning. So if anyone I'm, I'm there now. Yes. OK. I don't know what happened there. Did you just miss the last two slides? Yeah. I just wanted to talk about the floating wind costs, which I think you missed this one. The turbine manufacturer covers the biggest part of the cost to over 20 percent and the substructure another 20 percent. The capex, which includes the moorings and the installation, is about 63% of the total cost of the, of the floating wind turbine. And then the future maintenance over the next 25 years is another 37%. So in conclusion, we need vessels for survey work, met ocean, geophysical, geotechnical, heavy transport vessels for the substructure, dry transport, harbour tugs in all the different ports, cargo ships to move the anchors and chains to a marshalling port. Well, then we need anchor handling tugs to install the drag anchors or crane vessels to install the various pile options. We need different types of cable lay vessels. And then we need anchor handling tugs to tow out and make the mooring connection. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention today.